Hi everyone, this is Steve Shaw, founder and president of Bond Savvy, and thanks so much for joining. I founded Bond Savvy because corporate bonds are great investments, but very few people own them. And I want to change this. Only about 1% of investor assets are held in individual corporate bonds. Many folks believe they're, they're too complicated to understand, and I would believe most financial advisors actually fall into that, that same camp. And my goal is to make corporate bond investing accessible to as many different folks as possible. And so what Bond Savvy does is we make between 25 to 30 corporate bond investment recommendations every year to help individual and institutional investors maximize their returns. We also provide online educational videos and both the educational videos and the recommendations can be found in the buy tab on the Bond Savvy site. So let's get started. On slide two, when you think about corporate bonds, I want you to think about corporate bonds in, in a different light. I want you to think of them as a way to achieve equity upside, but without the, the equity downside, and without the, the volatility that, that stock investments can, can have. To give you an idea, uh, I've invested in, in corporate bonds for nearly the last five years. And from for investments that I made between January 2013 and January 2017, the best annualized return I achieved was 54%. The worst was minus 6%. And then I had a lot in between, uh, many in the teens, a number in, in the low 20s. And I want you to think of corporate bonds in, in a similar light in that don't just think of them as a way to, to clip coupons and make 2 or 3%, but look at them as a way to achieve high returns. Uh, and that's uh, that's the way that I've had success looking for where there's value in the marketplace, looking for bonds that can achieve strong total returns. Unfortunately, when most people invest in fixed income, they do it through what's generally been an underperforming uh, bond fund or an ETF. And the Vanguard Total Bond Market Index Fund is a perfect example. This is the largest bond fund that's out there, $190 billion dollars. And you see the meager returns. Uh, you see 0.3% in 2015, 2.5% in 2016, a little north of 3% this year. And that's because this fund has to put so much money to work that it invests in over 8,000 bonds. And when you invest in over 8,000 bonds, you're going to get some, some underperformers in there, many underperformers in there, uh, underperformers in there that dilute uh, the returns of the fund. They have to invest heavily in treasury bonds, heavily in agencies, which create lower returns. But unfortunately, this is where, where most investors are because they think that bond investing is all about clipping coupons and, and just generating a return of 2 or 3%. I've had a different approach on, on slide four, and you'll see the returns that I've been able to generate in my investment grade portfolio and my high yield portfolio, uh, over 11% year to date in 2017, in investment grade, over 6% in 2016 investment grade, and very strong high yield performance in 2016, uh, achieved 25%, and that included one investment that was uh, that achieved a 54% annualized return. And this is all from a, a different approach to to bond investing. It's it's for looking for bonds that are that are undervalued and that can generate strong total returns. And the way that I'm able to find bonds that can that can perform well. So again, I'm not looking at, I'm not just looking to clip coupons. I'm looking to find bonds that can increase in value and as a result, drive a strong total return. And, and doing that requires me to think differently about how I approach investing. And I believe it's differently than, than most folks approach, approach bond investing. And I go through each of the different areas and, and how I think about it compared to how other folks think about it. So the first one is, is what I would refer to as uber diversification. So most folks believe, you know what, I just need to have exposure to as many different bonds as possible. And you know, if you look at that Vanguard fund, uh, that has about 8,000 bonds in it. I believe that's the wrong way to go about it. I'm, I'm more in the camp of, of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, where I believe it's beneficial to have a focused portfolio of bonds that you know really well bonds that are at a discount relative to where other comparable bonds are trading that can drive strong returns. Uh, so I look at it in a much different way and I, I look to identify bonds that can drive those, those strong total returns. 
Again, on returns objectives, we're not looking to clip coupons. Uh, if, if you look at my returns over the last four and a half years, so this is ending September 30th of 2017, uh, my annualized return in high yield corporate bond investments was 22% and investment grade was approximately 9%. And again, that's, that's primarily from not only uh, the coupons that I'm receiving, but also from, from capital appreciation. Bond laddering. Now that's a, that's what many folks do when, when they put together a portfolio of bonds and that they'll, they'll look say over the next 10 years and say, okay, you know, I need to have a certain amount of principal repaid on these on these certain dates and they'll put together a, a bond ladder that'll say okay you know we need to have a bond that matures in 2026 we need to have a bond that matures in 2027 and i have a different approach than that i look for bonds across the maturity spectrum so i'm not just looking for you know to, to, to try to satisfy a bond ladder i, I look throughout the entire corporate bond universe, which contains thousands of bonds, and I look for where the value is. And so while, while bond laddering is, you know, can be better than, than just putting your money into a mutual fund or an ETF, uh, I believe that there's a better way to construct a bond portfolio. And that's by identifying bonds that have the best chance to appreciate in value. And that, that's what I do. Next is interest rates. And, and I've heard so many different folks talk about, you know, this is a, a low yield environment and it's a rising rate environment. And, and when rates go up, then, then the bonds are, are, are just going to be in real, a really tough spot. And I just believe that the most folks that they hear people on the news media talk about it and they don't have a clear understanding in terms of which rates are rising, which rates are not rising and what impact that ultimately has on, on, on the price of, of corporate bonds. Uh, I've actually shown that in flat rates, or even when rates have been ticking up, that I've been able to achieve extremely strong returns on, on a number of different investments. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that you need to separate high yield corporate bonds from investment grade corporate bonds when you look at that, because high yield corporate bonds do not trade in relation to interest rates. Investment grade corporate bonds do, but I've been able to find investment opportunities where I've still been able to achieve strong returns regardless of, you know, even if rates have ticked up and I'll give, I'll give some examples of that in a moment. Next is the fundification of, of investing. And so, you know, I, I would refer to this as, you know, what it's, it's the status quo. And so it's, it's how people have elected to get their fixed income exposure, doing it through funds. But if you think about it, owning a bond fund or a bond ETF defeats the purpose of owning a bond because you own a bond because you want to have return of your principal at a set date. You own a bond because you want to have your a fixed coupon paid on a certain date. And you also want to be able to pinpoint your asset allocation. But if you own one of these bond funds or ETFs, you generally have no idea what you're investing in. I mean, you'll know every quarter if you, if you go and you dive into, uh, you know, dive into the prospectus and all different sorts of reports, but many of these funds are over allocated in things that you may not necessarily want. For instance, the iShares Ag ETF has 10% of cash. And that automatically, as soon as you buy that, it over allocates you to cash. And that, that's not a good thing for many investors. Uh, next is investment holding periods. And so most folks, this relates somewhat to the bond laddering concept in that you know, many folks will look at, you know, once they buy a bond, they just wanna buy it and then own it and hold it to maturity. What I believe is, is the better way is to constantly be evaluating the bonds you have in your portfolio and compare those to what other bonds are out there and, and the, the return opportunity that those bonds present. And you know, sometimes that might mean holding a bond for a few years. Sometimes it might mean holding it for uh, you know, less than a year. Uh, but I believe it's important for investors to be flexible in terms of how long they hold bonds and not just think of it as, okay, this is a bond that I'm gonna buy at par or buy at 95 and I'm just gonna hold it to maturity because the world changes uh, each and every day and there can be changes in investment opportunities uh, very frequently. And so I, I, I don't believe that we, it's, it's the best way to just buy a bond and necessarily hold it to maturity. Last point is on, on after-tax returns. And this is where you know, conventional, conventional wisdom is, well, you know, it's gotta be municipal bonds. Those have the best after-tax returns, but I'll show you 
as a result of having bonds that can achieve a significant amount of capital appreciation, that when you factor that into your after-tax return, you can have after-tax returns that can exceed muni bonds. I'll show you one bond investment that I made in a Microsoft bond that achieved a 9% annualized after-tax return. And that's a triple A rated bond. And that's gonna be a really hard return to try to achieve with, with the municipal bond. So my goal for this presentation is I want you to get comfortable with corporate bond investments. I want you to, to, to one day feel as comfortable investing in a corporate bond, just like you do in a stock. And the way I believe you get there is by knowing more about them and by getting comfortable with them. And my, my goal is to educate you and, and get you as comfortable as you can possibly be. So you can use these investments for your benefit and you can capitalize on these investments. Here's some of the key points that I'm going to go through. So first is, I'm going to walk you through why it's so important for you to become a good corporate bond investor. I'm going to show how many folks just aren't taking advantage of, of corporate bonds today. I'm going to go through the five myths of, of corporate bond investing. And I believe that that's a big part of, of why folks aren't investing in corporate bonds today. And when I walk through these myths, it's not just to walk through a list, it's to, to help you understand how the market works. Because what I'll do is I'll be taking the other side of many arguments that have been made, for instance, people believing that the market's not transparent or you can't outperform the big funds. And I'm gonna take the other side of those arguments. And I'm gonna show you exactly how this market works. So you're gonna know uh, what you need to know. And the last point is I'm gonna make one corporate bond recommendation. This is a recommendation that I made back on September 26, 2017 in the first edition of the Bondcast. I'm gonna walk you through the analysis that I go through. I'm gonna tell you the company, I'm gonna tell you the bond uh, and all the, all, all the work that I did to determine that this bond was, was one that I was gonna recommend. Okay, so on slide eight, in terms of a, a disclaimer, so, so first, when I make these recommendations, these recommendations are not attuned to any one individual portfolio. So I'm not saying, okay, you know, you're 58 years old, you've got X hundred thousand dollars to invest. This is right for you. What I'm saying is, is that based on my analysis of the corporate bond market, these are the most compelling investments that I see at a given point in time. And so when I made these recommendations and when I, when I show you the recommendation that I made, that was a recommendation I made on September 26th of 2017. Uh, where I made a recommendation for two high yield corporate bonds and two investment grade corporate bonds. The next is, is that while corporate bonds have, have less risk than stocks, uh, these are investments. Uh, you're, you could lose your principal because investing in corporate bonds involves risk and the, the, the principal can go up and down when you invest in corporate bonds. And the last point is with respect to past performance, uh, I have, I'll, I'll be going through some of the past performance I have achieved, but as it says here, past performance, not indicative of future results. Moving on to slide nine. This is the importance of becoming a strong corporate bond investor. You'll see on the left, on the left side of, of slide nine, a big trend of, of what's been happening in the marketplace. So you'll see that in 1980, there were a little bit more than than 5,000 publicly traded stocks. And that number peaked in 1996 at about 8,000 and then it's fallen to where at the end of 2015, there were only about 4,400. And what's happened is, is that there's obviously been a lot of consolidation of companies and then fewer and fewer companies have been going public. Uh, and when you look at the chart on the right, this is the main reason, this is one of the reasons why I believe corporate bond investing is gonna become really, is gonna become even more important than it is today. So the, and why I believe the trend on the, on the left side is gonna continue. The orange bars are the market size. So common stock market about $31 trillion, municipal bonds 3.8 trillion, corporate bonds 8.6 trillion, treasuries close to 14 trillion. But then you look at the issuance. And so this is how many, you know, new bonds are being issued every year in terms of overall dollars. And you'll see for corporate bonds, it's nearly 1.3 trillion. And for treasuries, it's about 1.7 trillion. But stock, it's only 150 billion. And 
what that tells me is over time, there are going to be fewer and fewer publicly traded stocks. Uh, you know, maybe it ticks up from where it is now, but, but many companies are on the sidelines. They're, they're staying private for, for a long period of time. There, there's very little new issuance, but there's tons of corporate bond issuance. And so if you think about where the trend is taking you, Right now, on any given day, you can invest in about 8,500 corporate bonds spread across high yield and investment grade. Uh, and if there's more issuance, there continues to be more issuance, that means there's going to be more investment opportunities. And since you have more bonds, uh, there can be more opportunity because while the corporate bond market is getting more efficient, it's still not as efficient as the stock market. So you can find opportunities where a bond is mispriced and that can be an excellent opportunity to, to make an investment that can, that can drive a strong return. But I just want folks to understand how significant the issuance is within corporate bonds. It's almost as, as, as much as the, the, the treasury market. And it's, it's a trend that it's really important to be aware of when you're thinking about what investments you're going to be making over over the next uh, over the next several years. Moving to slide ten, this is an analysis of what the current situation is, and the chart on the on the right side of of the of the slide shows an asset allocation survey from an organization called AAII, which is the American Association of Individual Investors, and you'll see that when you look at the allocation of, of stocks and stock funds combined about 69%. And you compare that to bonds and bond funds, which is about 15%. That doesn't seem that out of whack, especially given how well the stock market has performed in, uh, in, in 2017. What doesn't make a lot of sense though, is when you compare stock funds to stocks and then bond funds to individual bonds, because when you look at stock funds, they, that, that allocation is about 1.3 times more than individual stocks, but bond funds is about five times more than individual bonds. And that seems kind of strange because there are very important benefits for owning the individual bond. First, you get return of your principal at maturity. Second, you get payment of a fixed coupon. And also the, the wide scale of diversification that one might need for a stock fund because stocks can be so volatile isn't necessarily needed in in bonds because bonds aren't nearly as volatile as, as stocks and so when i look at this i ask well why is this the case and when we move to slide 11 the first question is as well is it because of better returns you know are, are there better returns on on bond funds than than individual bonds and the clear answer for that is is no uh, when you compare the returns that I've generated, so this is my investment grade portfolio uh, for 2017. So I own five bonds. Uh, and when you look at some of these bonds, the Jefferies bond, so Jefferies is an investment bank, has returned 14.5% through September 30th. Discovery Communications, nearly 10%. Microsoft, Apple, all those combined have generated a return of, of 11%. You compare that to the iShares Ag ETF, which is a little north of 3%, uh, the returns are very different in terms of what you can accomplish owning individual bonds versus owning, owning one of these large bond funds or bond ETFs. So on slide 12, you think, all right, you know, bond investors don't necessarily need the diversification that someone in the equity market needs. And, and the reason why that is, is that bonds are less volatile than stocks. And so while a stock can plummet 30% in a day, generally it's not gonna happen to a bond uh, unless if it, it gets into distress. Uh, so you know, th that's another reason why you would wanna own the bond. Then there were the other advantages that we talked about before in terms of having return of your principal at maturity, payment of a fixed coupon, more precise asset allocation. And the last piece is, is that as an investor, and so if you're an individual investor, let's say that you're a financial advisor or a family office uh, or a corporate treasurer, you name it, you have a finite amount of money to, to manage, whether that be a couple hundred thousand dollars, several million dollars, you name it. And so you have a big advantage over a large money manager 
such as you know Vanguard, BlackRock, because those guys have so much to manage. I mean, I wouldn't know what to do if I had to manage four or five trillion dollars and then put a hundred billion dollars in a fund or fifty billion dollars into a fund. And that's the problem that they face in that they have to put treasury bonds in these funds, they have to put agency bonds in these funds, and and it's it's this mixture of of stuff that that in the end doesn't generate very strong returns. But as an individual investor and, and as 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 a financial advisor, someone who is is managing a smaller amount of money, you have the advantage because you can find the very best bonds, the ones that can appreciate in value, and that's what you keep in your portfolio. You don't need to have all the noise that these huge bond funds have that ultimately dilute their returns. So on to slide 13. So the reasons why we are where we are, we are in terms of uh, the lack of individual bond holdings in, 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 uh, in investor portfolios is, from my view, comes down to these five myths, which I'm going to get into, into detail. So first is people think the market, the corporate bond market is not transparent. People believe you have to be extremely wealthy. Uh, you have to you know, somewhere out in the Hamptons in order to, to invest in bonds. They don't believe that you can out, you can uh, achieve a return stronger than the low cost funds. They believe that there aren't any compelling returns in this low, this low rate environment. And the last is, is that if you buy a bond, then because the market's so inefficient, you won't be able to sell it. Or if you try to sell it, you're going to get ripped off. And, and I believe the opposite for all five of these points. And I go through each of them uh, right now. So slide 14, this is what I've shown here, and, and I'm going I'm to address uh, myths one and two. So the, the first, these myths are it's an opaque market and it's only for the super rich. This is an excerpt of, of a bond search that I did a, a number of months ago. And remember, this, this is being recorded uh, on November 15th, 2017. And so, you know, you obviously get the information around who the issuer is and, and the maturity date and the coupon and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but then you get information around, okay, well, what's the, what's the bid ask, uh, the bid offer quotes. And just so folks know, bonds are quoted as a percentage of their, their face value. So the face value of a bond is $1,000. If there, if you see a quote here, for instance, uh, for this, uh, for this Knight Ritter bond of 80 spot 94. So all, I'm, all the spot means is just a, a decimal point. A spot 94, that means you could buy the bond for $809.40. And you'll see that the bid ask spreads here are generally you know, under, under a point, sometimes maybe a little bit more, maybe, maybe a little bit less. So the bid ask spreads are pretty reasonable. Uh, and then you'll see the yield. So you automatically get a lot of information about the bond. You'll see how much quantity is behind each of each of the quotes. So what this is showing is, let's take the, the Knight Ritter bond. So if you come over all the way to the bottom right, this is saying that for a quote of, of 80 spot 94, that would have a, a yield to, we'll just call it the yield to maturity, I'll, you know, yield to worse, I'll explain a little bit later, uh, of, of 9.61%. And there are 150 bonds behind that quote and the minimum is one. So if you buy one bond or if you buy 150 bonds, you get the same price. And that's why I say you don't have to be wealthy to invest in bonds because you can make a bond investment for as small of a denomination as, as one bond. Now, I don't recommend trading in, in those sizes. I'd recommend trading at least five bonds or at least 10 bonds, but you can get an idea in terms of <clears throat> what the market looks like just by taking a look at, at these search results. And so that's when I, uh, when I do my bond search and, and I, I start narrowing down investments, this is obviously where I always start and I start to, to narrow things down from here. But what you have when you invest in bonds is all sorts of information. It's information that you can use to then determine whether a bond is a good investment. So on to slide 15. <clears throat> what I'm showing here are, are two key areas that can help you assess the pricing of a bond. And so this bond is, is Xerox four eighths of 2035. So when I say that, all it means is that it has a coupon of 4.8% and the bond matures on, on March 1st of 2035. And the table that I have here on the, on the bottom left is what's called the depth of book. 
So there are, there are seven different dealers. So these dealers can run the gamut from, from Goldman Sachs to UBS to, to, to smaller dealers. And uh, there are seven of them who are quoting the bond. You'll see that what's called the top of book is a bid price of 92 spot 63 and an offer price of 93. So you could buy this bond at 93 or $930 for the bond and you could sell it at that exact point in time of 92 spot 63. Uh, now, what's important to keep in mind is that you'll see the quantities behind these as well as the minimums. <clears throat> now, the, on the offer side, the minimum here is, is somewhat of an anomaly in that a 50 bond minimum is, is rare from, from my experience. Generally, minimums are in the, the two to 10 ballpark. And that's where you see, uh, you know, if you look at these other quotes, two bond minimum, two bond minimum for the third dealer. Uh, but if you wanted the best price in this case, you'd have to have a minimum order size of 50 bonds. But even if you only had two bonds, you'd still get a pretty good price of 93 spot, spot 06. And the bond is, is yielding, yields a maturity of 5.43%. So you'd be buying it at a, at a discount to par. So that's, you know, buy it at 93, the coupon is 4.8%, but since you're buying it at a discount, the yield is obviously higher than the coupon. So the yield is, is 5.43%. Uh, and so from my view, you have a competitive marketplace here. You've got seven dealers who are competing for your order. And I view this as being a fairly transparent market in that if you go onto your online trading system, if you go onto Fidelity or Schwab or Vanguard, you can see all this information. You just need to click on what's called the depth of book icon. Now, the other important thing to do before you were to make an investment is to look at what's called trace. And this is the table here on the right. And what trace is, is trace is a reporting engine, which is run by FINRA. And what it shows is it shows where bonds have been, where bond trades have been executed. And so you'll see that on the depth of book side, uh, this is as of 11.33 a.m. on October 24th, 2017. And this is showing the trades that have taken place. And this started at 9.45 a.m. And you'll see that there were a number of trades all the way up to 11.18. And it also shows the quantities of, of each trade, the price of the tra uh, the price at which it was executed, and then the side that's being reported. So what's important to, to glean from, from this is that a dealer to dealer trade, think of that as the, the wholesale market. So those are those are the big guys. that's UBS and Goldman Sachs trading with each other. Uh, and then the customer buy is when a customer of say UBS or Morgan Stanley actually buys the bond. And what you'll see here is uh, you, know, you see dealers trading with each other at 93, right around 93 spot three. But then this customer buy, uh, you know, there was a markup of, of two points, which is pretty significant. Uh, and that can impact your return depending on how long you can, you can hold it. Uh, now, if you, if you buy the bond from an online, uh, an online broker, the markup is generally a lot less than this. And just to give you an example, so Fidelity uh, marks, up, marks up or down the bond uh, by $1 per 1,000. So you would, see, you would see a price here of, of 93 spot four if it happened right after that. But uh, the, the reason why I show this is when you're comparing your price and you see this price of 93, so you could buy the bond at 93, you then wanna compare it to what's going on at Trace. And so you'll see, the dealer to dealer price was 93 spot three. And the price that's available right now is 93 spot is, is 93 or 93 spot 06 if you, if you don't have 50, uh, if you can't do 50. Uh, so what this tells me right away is that you're getting it at a reasonably fair price compared to where the market is. Uh, now, if you're using a broker, you'll have to assess whether paying that couple point markup makes sense for you. Uh, but just so you have all that information, you can, use, you can use everything that's here to determine whether you're getting a good price. Okay, so on to myth number three, which is you can't beat the market in low cost funds. And what I've shown here are 
my returns for uh, investment grade corporate bonds over the last couple of years. So on the, the chart on the left, where it says Steve's IG corporate bonds is just my investment grade corporate bonds this year, they've returned 11.14%. Last year was 6.33%. The iShares LQD, that's the, that's the corporate bond iShares ETF. Uh, that's, hasn't done bad, you know, 5.56% this year, 5.97% uh, last year. But where all the money is, a lot of the money is, is on, in these big funds. So the Vanguard Total Bond Market Fund, where it's a, a fairly anemic 3% or 2.5%. And the reason for that is, is you look at the Vanguard Total Bond Market Fund, $190 billion across 8,248 bonds. And so if you think about it, there's really no need for someone to own 8,248 bonds because if you own that number of bonds, there are going to be some really bad bonds in there uh, as opposed to doing the hard, you know, doing the analysis, which is what I do and identifying the, the, the bonds that have the best chance to appreciate in value. You know, think about it. If you're, it's just like picking a, picking a team, would you rather have the five best players on your team? Or would you rather have the 500 best players on your team? Uh, that you all have to play equally. I, I think it's it's a, it's it's an easy decision, and it shows the benefit of of owning individual corporate bonds. Next myth is low after tax returns given the given the low rate environment. And what I show on this slide on, on slide 17 is is what I view as my playbook, uh, and I've shown uh, I've shown six different investments that I've made in corporate bonds. Over the last four and a half years, I've made 17 corporate bond investments. Uh, I'll continue to make more uh, over, the coming, over the coming months. Uh, so you'll see what I do is I look to identify bonds that are trading at a discount. For example, I invested in this Apple bond. So Apple 385 is a 2043. So it pays a 3.85% coupon, returns in 2043. Uh, and I bought the bond at, at 85 spot 07. And when I bought the bond, it had a yield to maturity of 4.8%. Uh, you'll see that as of September 30th, the bond had appreciated in value to par and three quarters. Uh, and that's driven a nearly 9% annualized return since I've owned the bond. Similar story for, for Jeffries. Jeffrey six and a half, so 43 and Microsoft. Now Microsoft, Microsoft has a AAA credit rating. Only two companies have a AAA credit rating. And because I was able to identify a bond that was trading at a discount, about 92, since it's appreciated in value, it's returned nearly 12%. And I believe most folks, when you think of investing in corporate bonds or investing in bonds in general, you think, you know what? Okay, you know, I'll just clip my coupon and get my two, three, four percent. But I don't believe that that's the best way to look at it. I believe you need to, to look at investing in corporate bonds as a way to maximize your returns, not just to, uh, to minimize risk. Uh, and that's, that, that's where I've had success. Uh, now, turning over to, to high yield, you know, I, I give two examples here, two Cablevision bonds and a Toys R Us bond. Now the Cablevision bonds, again, I was, I was able to buy those at a discount, but if you look at this one, the, the uh, five and seven eighths of, of 2022, you know, this had a yield to maturity of 10.1% of when I bought it. You know, Cablevision is a good cable company and the company's performed reasonably well. Uh, the bond has, achieved, has, has, uh, has gone up to 103 and a half and that annualized return is 23%. And you think about it, okay, so that, that's effectively doubled the return to the stock market over the last couple of years or, you know, in, in 2016 uh, and has done better than the stock market this year for a bond. And it just shows you the power of, of being able to pinpoint your investments. The last one on, on this slide is has been my most successful investment to date, which is uh, Toys R Us. Now, we all know the troubles that the Toys R Us has had this year. This was an investment that I made in 2016. Uh, I bought it at, at 83, at 83, there's a very large bid ask spread when I bought it, the, the bid ask spread was about six points. Uh, but when I did my analysis, I saw a bond that had a very high yield to maturity of, of 24.6%. And when I did my analysis, I, I, I knew that uh, the company had about 400 million in cash, it had a billion dollars on its uh, available credit capacity. Uh, the company, 
key credit ratio called interest coverage, which is just the company's cash flow to, to interest expense was about 1.6 times. So I was comfortable that the company was going to be able to pay its interest and then repay the bonds when they came due. And what happened was on September 29th of 2016, the bonds were redeemed at 102 spot 59. And with the interest that I received and the capital appreciation, I achieved an annualized return of 54% on that investment. So moving on to uh, on to slide 18, the one thing to keep in mind, and this was a point that I made early on in the presentation, is, is the impact of, of rates to bond prices. And you know, folks get fixated on the Fed, and you'll see that what I've shown here on, on this on this uh, chart are the yield curves for the 1, 7, 10, and 30-year Treasury. So the, the one-year Treasury, you'll see that that's, that's been the one that has been taking up. Uh, you know, it was about one and a quarter at the end of September. But if you look at what's happened with other rates, uh, you know, the, 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 the tenure has been pretty flat. So it was about two and a half percent at the end of October 2013. And now it's a little bit less than that. Uh, the, the 30 year has, has come down a little bit. And it, it's really important to, to, to focus on which is the relevant treasury because if, if you're investing so so the bonds that i've invested in uh in the past have generally been longer dated bonds so the microsoft bonds mature in 2055 so the, the comparable treasury in that case is the 30-year treasury that's what that's what the microsoft bond gets benchmarked off and you'll see that when i bought the bond on february 12th of 2016 the 30-year treasury had a yield of of 2.6 percent and that yield has gone up to close to 2.9% when I valued the bond at the end of September. So people say, you know, well, what's gonna happen when, when rates go up? Then here's what happened when rates went up. The, the, the price of the bond uh, increased very significantly. Uh, same thing with Jeffrey's bonds. The Jeffrey's bonds I bought January 17th, 2017, 30-year treasury was 2.93%. It's uh, been relatively flat since, but there's been a significant appreciation in the price of that bond. Uh, Cablevision, again, rates have been re relatively flat since I bought it. So the notion that bond prices just move solely in connection with interest rates is wrong, in that there can be all sorts of things that can happen. A bond could get upgraded, it could get downgraded. Uh, you know, the company performance could be strong or could be weak. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of things related to that particular bond that if you, if you buy the actual bond, you can somewhat insulate yourself from what's going on with, with interest rates because ultimately, if you're able to find a great bond at a good price, even if rates go up, you can still achieve strong performance with that, with that bond. And this on, on slide 19, just a, a case study for the Microsoft bond. So just to give folks an idea in terms of the after-tax returns that one can generate. So this was uh, just to, to cut to the, to the uh, the chase, this generated a 9% after-tax return. And the way that that happened was, so this was a, a relatively small investment that I made in February of 2016. So I bought the bonds at 92 spot 17, 10 bonds, market value of $9,217, paid a $20 commission. So I invested a little bit more than $9,000, received interest payments uh, on these dates and the total interest received was about $650. But my capital appreciation, because now the bonds are worth $10,390, was $1,152.80. So my, my total return was $1,800. But when I look at my return on an after-tax basis, I first look at the yield, so that was 4.33%, assuming a 40% tax rate, the after-tax rate uh, return on that is 2.6%. And then a 6.34% after-tax rate of return on the capital appreciation. So again, you know, when you look at your muni bonds that you might have in your portfolio, you know, figure out if, if they've been able to achieve after-tax returns of, of 9%. And this is a AAA rated bond. And I, I would argue that, that Microsoft is, is as, good, it's as good of a credit as you can get. Um, so one, one thing for, for everybody to think of when you think of after-tax returns. 
On the slide 20, so, so myth number five is that once you buy a bond, uh, you'll have a real difficult time if you want to sell it. And I showed you the, the depth of book earlier. I showed bid-ask spreads for a number of bonds, but I, what I did a number of months ago was I did an analysis and I have two charts here. So these were, uh, this was analysis I did back in, in August 24th of 2017 where I compared the bid-ask spreads of investment grade bonds on the left and high yield corporate bonds on the right. And I looked at the bid-ask spreads of all these bonds. So you'll see that, and this is, so 18% so, uh, of the bonds. And so this was a sample size of 2,326 investment grade bonds. 18% had a bid-ask spread of less than or equal half a point. 25% had a bid-ask spread of greater than half a point or less than equal to a point and, and so on. Uh, so you have 90% of the quotes have a two-sided market, so meaning a live bid and offer spread. And 43% had a bid offer spread of, of a point or less. And that's, that's, that's significant because when you look at the median maturity of these bonds, it was 2039. And what happens in, in investment grade is that since these, these bonds are benchmarked off the comparable treasury, if you have a, a small change in the yield, that can often uh, have a profound impact in terms of the dollar price of the bond. So to have only a, a one point bid ask spread on, on a very long dated bond is, is a fairly narrow spread because the, the actual spread in terms of yield may only be uh, a, you know, a handful of basis points, which is, which is pretty narrow. In high yield, now people would think, Wow, you know, how, how could there ever be a competitive market in high yield? But you'll see that even more of the bonds, so 50% of the bonds had a bid ask spread of, of one point and under. Uh, now, one of the reasons for that is in high yield, you have, you generally have shorter maturity. So the median maturity for the high yield bonds was 2026. So about 13 years shorter than, than the median maturity of the investment grade bonds. And that's, that's one of the drivers for, for why you see some narrower bid ask spreads. Now there are some, some bonds, a greater number of bonds that don't have a bid side. Oftentimes that can happen if you know, a bond has struggled or a company is, is under duress. Uh, oftentimes there may not be a live bidder uh, for that. You could still, you can still sell it, it's just a more arduous process. Uh, but this just shows you what, what the live bid and offer quotes are for these, for these particular bonds. Now one thing to keep in mind, is that, as I mentioned below, the uh, the median maturity for these bonds was 2039 for investment grade and 2026 for high yield. And since you are going out further, farther in the curve, uh, you will see wider bid ask spreads. I also did an analysis, you'll see on the, the, this bottom line here of 2,850 investment grade bonds that had maturities of up to five years and the, and the median bid ask spread in that case was 0.2 points. So if you if, if you're looking to make an investment and you know you got to be you have to be a seller in six months or a year, then I wouldn't necessarily recommend going out long on the curve because you are going to have there's obviously a little bit more risk associated with that, and you're going to have a you'll typically have a, a bigger bid ask spread. So just something for you to think about as you as you compare different bonds. Moving on to slide 21, a lot of this I talked about before, so we'll, we'll just buzz through this, but again, this is the full depth of book uh, showing that in this case, you have a 0.37 point bid ask spread, a very full depth of book with, with seven different dealers. So you can sell the bond in a, in a fair marketplace. So just to review uh, some of the advantages of, of investing in an in individual corporate bond versus bond funds. So, I've shown you how I've been able to generate higher returns. There's also no recurring fees. And so when you buy these bond funds, you know, granted some of the low cost ones might only have, you know, five or 10 basis points or 0.05% or 0.1%, but, but many of them have annual fees of, of 1%, 1.7% uh, for some high yield bond funds. And then, one fund, the, uh, the BlackRock High Yield Bond Fund, has a load of 4%. So if you sell it within the first year, you pay 4%. Uh, and and those, those fees just eat at your returns. 
and as opposed to when you buy an individual bond, you'll pay, you know, you'll pay a fee. Uh, the, 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 the better online brokers do it for about a buck a bond. If you hold it, if you hold it to maturity, obviously don't pay any other fees. And if you have to sell it, then you would pay whatever, you know, whether there's a markup or, or I'm sorry, a markdown or, or a commission. Uh, that's markedly lower than the fees you pay with, with bond funds. You also get the benefits of owning the bond. So you get return of your principal maturity payment of the fixed coupon, and you have the more precise asset allocation in that I would encourage anyone of you listening who owns a bond fund to go into its prospectus or go into its holdings, go online and see everything that's in that bond fund. And you're going to see some stuff that will just shock you. You, know, you think you're buying a bond fund, but you know, there's all kinds of stuff in there. There are credit default swaps, there are interest rate swaps, there's, there could be stocks in there. Some can uh, you know, allow it to have up to 10% of common stock. All kinds of stuff that's in there. As I mentioned before, the iShares Ag has 10% cash. So you know, let's say that you had 16% of your portfolio all allocated to, to cash, and then you decide, all right, I'm going to put, I'm a conservative investor, I'm going to put everything into iShares Ag. Your cash asset allocation just went up to close to 24%, and that, that's not a good thing. The last advantage is, is that as I've made investments in corporate bonds over the last nearly five years, you know, I've I've, I've, I've had strong returns, but I've also made mistakes. And you know, those are mistakes that I'll continue to learn from and, and that'll help me improve as an investor for, for many years and, and decades to come. Uh, and that's what you'll be able to do as well if you, if you invest in individual bonds. If you invest in funds and ETFs, I, I tell you what, you're gonna be the same level of fund and ETF, you'll, you'll be the same level of investor that you are today that you will be in 10 years because you will not be learning because someone else is doing it for you. Someone else is just sort of throwing all this stuff into a fund and you're not gonna know, okay, you know, I invested in these five or six bonds and I invested at this time and, and here's what happened to rates and here's what happened to the company. And, and yeah, these, these investments did really well and that's gonna help inform my investing going forward. You won't be able to do that. And that, that's a key distinguishing factor between owning individual bonds and, and bond funds. So I'm going to go through an investment recommendation that I made on September 26 and the analysis behind it and, and, and how, I, how I go through everything. It's important to keep in mind that most investors don't have time to do this. And so my business, Bond Savvy, we do this for you. Uh, so we do all the analysis. We listen to earnings calls. We review the SEC filings. We, we do all the financial analysis and the credit analysis on our own and then share a review of that with you. So that as an investor, you can then make a decision as to, okay, you know, I'm comfortable investing in this given its risk, or I, I'm more risk averse and I'm more comfortable going with this lower yield, but uh, I, I'm more comfortable with it with the given investment. That's my, what I wanna do is, is educate you and provide you with a recommendation so that you have something actionable that you can use. So where do I start? And I always start at, at the bond search results and I showed I showed this screen a little bit uh, earlier on in the presentation. And what I do is you know, my, my sweet spot is generally investing in telecommunications, technology, media, financial services, uh, uh, retail, some general industry. I don't have experience in energy, so I've never made an investment in an energy bond, uh, but I have made investments in those other sectors. And so when I, when I go through a list like this and I see companies such as PP&L, uh, I've generally stayed away from, from that. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll start to go through these bonds. And so I'll look at something such as JCPenney. Now we all know the challenges of bricks and mortar retail. I have invested in bricks and mortar retail. I continue to invest in bricks and mortar retail from a, from a bond perspective. But something like you know, a JCPenney bond that matures in 2097 that's just something that would not be of interest. I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable going that far, that far out. Uh, hats off to the bankers who, who did that deal though. Uh, and even 2037, that, that would be too far for me. And so that's why I, uh, that's why I highlighted in red, that's a bond that I'm not gonna get comfortable with. Uh, now, if I was to look at any of these JCPenney bonds, there's one uh, that yields uh, uh, six and, and three eighths and that matures in 2036, you'll see that the, the bid offer spread isn't terrible. It yields a little more than 9%, but 
you know, the quantities aren't that significant. So I, I'm likely, I'm, I'm leaning toward a pass on that one. But then when I look at some of these others, uh, you know, Frontier is a highly levered company. Um, it's a company that I would, I, I would, that I have looked at. Uh, I've done some analysis on Hertz. Again, you, know, you look at a company like that and you see you know, these bonds pay nine and a half percent and their, their maturity isn't that far out. So that would be a bond that I would put on the short list. And so the bonds that I put on the short list were, were coded in, in yellow. And that's how I, that's how I go through my, go through my analysis. Uh, that's how I start my analysis. What I'm now going to do is is walk you through one investment recommendation I made. I'm going to talk you talk to you about the business, uh, what's happening with the business, uh, some of the underlying trends with the industry, and then I'm going to get into the financial analysis with the specific bond and the specific company. So the recommendation that I made back on September 26 was Albertsons. And the bonds were the Albertson 745s of 29. So this was a bond that paid a 7.45% coupon and the bond matures in 2029. Now Albertson's a very large grocery chain, uh, primarily in the Western half of, of the United States, uh, about 2,300 stores, a strong market share in, in the large share in, in the lion's share of its markets. You'll see this chart on the left hand side in terms of where it's generating its revenue. So it, it is primarily groceries. It does have, a number of pharmacies and gas stations within uh, right where its, its grocery stores are, but, but it's, it's still a grocery business. Uh, the, the challenge for the company has been same store sales. And you'll see that those had been generally strong uh, up until 2016. And that's when there was some, that's when there was some weakness. Uh, so in 16, you know, four months ending uh, June 17th of 2017, same store sales were down 2% when they reported their most recent quarter, uh, they were down a uh, high, you know, it was about 1.8 or 1.9%. And, and that's, that's where you'll see that there's an opportunity in this bond because if, if same store sales were going through the roof, the bond would be trading above par. But when I look at this company, I see a company that's solid operator, strong market share, as a backstop, it has you know it invests very heavily in its stores. It has a twelve billion dollar real estate portfolio. So if something were to go sideways with the company, that would help uh, that would help protect us. Uh, and and I'll get into the financials in a moment. But but by and large, Albertsons and so Albertsons also owns Safeway. Uh, it owns Acme. It owns A and P, which has obviously been through some restructuring. Uh, it's a it's a good company. Uh, when I go to slide twenty seven. You know, the first question that, that many people have in their mind was, well, how does how does Amazon Whole Foods impact this? And, and I'll tell you what the impact was, was that uh, Albertson's largest shareholder is Cerberus, a big hedge fund. And Cerberus has been in it for a while. They wanted to take it public this year. They filed all the regulatory documents. And then once the uh, once the Amazon Whole, Field, Whole Foods deal was announced, they uh, they postponed the IPO. So the company is no longer going public. And what happened was, is you had, you know, the bonds back in June were trading above par, and then you had Amazon Whole Foods happen. Then you had uh, the company report a bad quarter, and that's where the bonds were ultimately trading in the high 70s. But when I look at it, I see Albertsons as a company that competes day to day with some of the toughest competitors out there. So they're competing with the Walmarts and the Costco's and the Kroger's of the world. You look at the footprint, you know, sure, there are 450 Whole Foods stores, but they're interspersed throughout the country. Albertsons is a really strong footprint. They've been investing heavily in e-commerce and in home delivery. Uh, I just believe they have, they have a strong overall offering. And even though, you know, they're not going to grow leaps and bounds, I believe that it's a solid enough company that will be able to service the debt and, and ultimately uh, make this a good investment. So on slide 28, this is just to give you somewhat of, an, some of, somewhat of an idea in terms of how I look at evaluating bonds from a financial point of view. So I look at two key ratios and the first term that's in both of these ratios is called EBITDA. And EBITDA is just earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization. So it's, it's effectively trying to find a number. It's effectively a number that tells you how much cash you have coming in to pay your interest. Uh, and that's why it's 
you, you look at the net, it's why you look at your, your earnings before you have to pay interest, before you have to pay taxes, and before non-cash items such as depreciation and amortization. The two key ratios I look at are the next two columns. So first is interest coverage. That tells you how much cash flow you have compared to interest expense. So if you have a company that has $10 billion of EBITDA and it has $10 billion of interest expense, uh, that would be interest coverage of one times, which is not very good. Uh, if, however, you had a company that had $10 billion of EBITDA and $1 billion of interest expense, then that would be interest coverage of 10 times, and that's, that's really good. And that's where an investment grade company would, would be. Uh, and you see here that obviously the, the higher the interest coverage, the lower the default risk of, of, of the company. Uh, next is leverage ratio. And just think of that as total debt divided by your cash flow or your EBITDA. And think of it as, let's say a company has $5 billion of debt and it has a billion dollars of EBITDA. So in that case, the leverage would be five times. That's, that's where a high yield issuer would be. And the way to think of it is, is it's effectively the number of years it would take to pay off all the debt if you could just use EBITDA to pay off the debt. So if you didn't have to pay taxes, you didn't have interest, you didn't have all other sorts of stuff, that's what it gives you a sense of. So if you have uh, you know, a leverage ratio of, of one times is very low, uh, that would mean that there'd be a very low risk of default. When it starts to get up to eight times, that's when I get a little nervous and uh, often we'll, we'll typically stay away from investments that are that, are that, that high. So on to slide 29, and this is, so the last several slides are, are the analysis that I serve up as part of the bond savvy business. So when I make a recommendation, so I'll make between 25 to 30 investment recommendations per year, I will, I, I wanna give you enough information so that you can compare bonds to other bonds and they can make the decision for yourself in terms of what makes sense, because I'm not, uh, I'm not a, uh, a registered representative. I'm not speaking to anyone's individual portfolio. These are not individualized recommendations. These are, as I said before, based on my analysis of the, of the corporate bond industry or the corporate bond market. And so this bond, so the Albertsons 745 to 2029, just to tell you what these numbers are. So the, the, the nine digit code below the Albertsons name is a QSIP, C-U-S-I-P. And that's just the identifier of, of the bond. Uh, and when you go and want to invest in this bond, you would just enter the QCIP. So you enter those nine digits, ticket would come up, and then you can go and, and make, make your investment. Uh, just some of these numbers. So the, the quote, and this is a quote that was made on, on September 25th, so it, it's back a couple months, uh, was 77 spot 57, 78 spot 4. So not, not bad, you know, a little bit less than, than a one-point bid offer spread. Uh, the yield... Uh, is 10.7%, and the issuance size was 650 million. Now, keep you know, what I do when I go through all these bonds because Albertsons has, gosh, probably 10 to 15 different bonds. So not, I not only evaluate the company, but then I evaluate which bond makes the most sense to invest in. And Albertsons does have some fairly illiquid bonds that only have an issuance size of maybe 25 or, or some odd million. I want to make sure that there's enough issuance size so that if we do have to sell the bond, there's enough liquidity in the market so that if you have to sell, you can you can sell. Uh, and you'll see that you know, that compares to these other bonds. You know, this bond up here, an investment grade bond, had an issuance size of 900 million. Uh, this other investment grade bond is 1.25 billion. Generally, investment grade bonds, which are the higher credit quality bonds, will have higher issuance sizes uh, than than the high yield bonds. Uh, there's just a wider universe of people who can buy them. When I look at the ratios, so leverage and, and interest coverage, you see leverage is 4.3 times and interest coverage is three times. Now, uh, I've known, I, I know many companies who have leverage of four times and their bonds don't yield 10.7%, their bonds yield 5%. And so this is, this is what got me interested in this bond in that I saw from a risk return standpoint, I saw a company that, that certainly has some leverage on it, leverage just meaning debt, but it's not over levered. Uh, and so you have, you have an opportunity to have a nice risk, uh, risk reward here. Now, the reason why it's at 10.7% is 
the company is not really growing. So you know, revenue growth of 0.4% uh, year over year, negative EBITDA, but it's still a big company. So $60 billion of, of revenue, 2.7 billion of debt, I'm sorry, 2.7 billion of EBITDA. And what I wanna do is I, I've shown these other recommendations. Now, if you wanna know what these other recommendations are, you just go into the buy tab and buy the, the, uh, the initial uh, edition of the bond cast. But you'll see that you know, there, there's a, a real risk reward scenario here. So this bond, leverage of one times, uh, 17 times interest coverage, which is huge. And interestingly, it has better credit ratios than this recommendation for bond. There's better credit, credit ratios, but it pays more. And it pays more because it's a more challenged company. So both recommendation, both the company and recommendation one or recommendation four are, are, are rated investment grade, but the company in recommendation one is, is in a more challenged industry than recommendation four. You know, the company in recommendation four is, is, is the gold standard in, in one particular industry. And, and that's why there's, that's why you have a little bit of a higher yield to this, uh, to this particular bond. Uh, but generally, you know, most of these companies are not growing from, from a revenue standpoint, uh, not growing very strongly. And so that's, that's the case where, you know, with, with fewer and fewer stock investment opportunities out there, you need to think of, you know, where can you really make money? And what my playbook is, is to buy bonds like these that are trading in the eighties or trading in the low nineties. And for instance, if this bond appreciates to par in a couple of years, then not only will I get this, this four and a half percent yield, but then I would also get about a, a 6% per year capital appreciation return. So that's over 10% for a bond that is a very high credit quality, but not necessarily in a stock that I'd want to own because revenue growth is where it is and it's not really a growth, a growth company. So moving on to slide 30, this is just some additional information on, on the company. So we talk about, uh, company's debt, cash on hand, the credit facility, some of the upcoming maturities, because it's really important, especially for, for high yield. So recommendation two in the Albertsons bond, those are two high yield issuers. It's really important to understand when the debt is coming due, because that can help you understand, okay, you know, if the company's got, you know, a lot coming due over the next year. So for instance, Albertsons only has 200 million coming due in 2018, and 200 million coming due in 2019, uh, but the company has 813 million of cash on hand. You remember that it had $2.7 billion of EBITDA. I'm pretty comfortable that it's gonna be able to pay its interest and pay these upcoming maturities. So it's not as if it's got a gun to its head at a specific point in time. I also look at the credit capacity. So you know, does it have a senior credit facility that can draw down on uh, to either fund expansion or if, if the, uh, the business hits a little bit of a bump? So to wrap up, uh, starting to wrap up on slide 31, uh, when you invest, uh, you know, it's really important when you, when you decide which broker to use to understand what inventory you're seeing and whether that's the full inventory. Uh, most online brokers uh, show you the full inventory. Uh, some financial advisor network brokers may only show you the, the, the inventory that their desk has. And so that's just a conversation that you need to have with your either broker or financial advisor and clearly understand how that all works. And I have a full discussion on this in the crash course on corporate bond investing, which you can, which you can buy on, on the buy tab. Uh, I'd recommend executing trades between nine and 3 p.m. Uh, you know, if you go after, especially if you go after four o'clock, you could have a, a trader who's, I don't know, chilling out and may not be that responsive. And so you just wanna make sure that you have as many dealers who are competing for your, your, your order at the same time. And if you do that in the, in the middle part of the day, so from nine to three, that's usually a good, a good rule of thumb. Uh, the last point on this slide is when you buy a bond, so I showed you what the market prices of the different bonds are, uh, but those market prices may be a little bit different than the price that you see in your statement, because the price you see in your statement is what's called an evaluated price. And so it's just, Something to be mindful of in that if you, let's say you buy a bond at 95 and then you see it on your statement at 93 and a half, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that that would be the price of the bond, but it's just the estimated price of that bond based on all sorts of pieces of information. So it's just something to be something to be mindful of. And to wrap up, to, to summarize a, a few points, this is something that I made, a point that I made early on is that don't think of corporate bonds as just something to clip coupons from. Think of them as, as a way to generate an equity-like return, but without the, the downside of the stock market. Uh, I look at, at bond investing as, as a science because there are there's so many pieces of information that you have that if you're able to, to use all that information, the price of the bond, the yield, the maturity, uh, where other bonds are currently priced, then information about the company's financials and how that ties into when the bonds mature and when principal payments are due and all sorts of things, gives you an idea in terms of whether a bond is a good value or not. And I believe it, it's, it's, it's a clearer path than when investing in the stock market, which I consider to be more of an art. And the last point is, is you have an advantage. You have an advantage because whether you're an individual investor or a family office uh, or a corporate treasurer, you have a finite, amount of, a finite amount, of, amount of money to invest. That's a big advantage over a large fund company that has trillions of dollars to invest and puts tens of billions of dollars in any one fund and has to invest in all sorts of different bonds in that fund, many of which aren't very good bonds. You can find the best bonds that can drive the strongest returns. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, definitely check out our site, bondsavvy.com, and uh, I hope you can become a successful corporate bond investor. Thanks so much.